Good morning, happy Sabbath. I'm so happy to see you. And I'm happy to see some of you that have been away for a while. You probably had some fun or some challenges to deal with. And I would like to also welcome everybody online joining us this morning in the celebration of divine love through Jesus Christ, the Savior. Has anybody here ever done car drifting? Car drifting? You're not very vocal about it. Did you do car drifting in your vacation? I have done car drifting unintentionally several times. And most of those incidents were minor, nothing special about it. I had the wheel in my hands, but the other wheels decided to just drift. But I had a few moments when after the drifting, I had to stop and regain my composure. It was obvious to me in those moments that I had totally lost control. And uh, if somebody else had not regained control, it would have been terrible for me. Those moments were awful and awesome at the same time. Now, I know there are people that do car drifting intentionally because they want to do so. And uh, I know that risk-taking and adrenaline can result easily in addiction. So some people can even become addicted of car drifting. But some become professionals. They are professional car drifters. And from what I gather, it is thrilling to be in between losing control and still being in control. I would like to introduce to you somebody that was an excellent drifter. Somebody that knew exactly how to lose control and then how to regain control. So much so that those around him had no idea he was a drifter. He has been drifting for quite some time, and nobody knows what he is doing. He has a lot of respect. He has gained the trust of his companions. He is at the same time a well-trusted economical or business financial expert and a thief. He's drifting, but nobody knows he's drifting. He has the money bag. He knows how to use this talk about helping the poor while he is helping himself to the content of the bag. I can see that you already have recognized my character. Quite a personality. I would like us to open the Bible in the Gospel of Matthew. Gospel of Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26 from 16, 
So from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Let us pray. Lord, as we look at the life of this drifter, we would like to understand how you deal with this phenomenon of spiritual drifting and how you are out there trying to keep us on the right trajectory. Help us understand in Jesus' name through the Holy Spirit. Amen. When I watch car drifting, I'm always in between, wow, and you guys must be crazy. Because what happens there is uh, beyond what I can handle when uh, I see somebody drifting out in a very dangerous way and then out of a sudden, everything is under control. That was Judas. Judas has been drifting for quite some time. And uh, at this point here, he has already sold Jesus for the price of a slave. And now he's waiting for the moment when he can hand him over. The convenient time when he can give him over to those where, to whom he sold him. And the gospel says, now on the first day, verse 17, of the feast, actually the Greek says, now on the first of the unleavened bread, which actually has to be Nisan the 13th, because on the 14th, Jesus was going to die to meet the substance of the shadow, because his death were for, was foreshadowed, and now he was going to die at the time when uh, the Pesach or the Pascha lamb was going to die. And the night before, he eats his last meal with his disciples. So it says that the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Pascha or the Pesach, the Passover? It seems that Jesus was asking for this special meal to happen, a Pesach meal, one night before the Pesach meal that the Jewish people would have. Verse 18 continues, and he said, go into the city to a certain man, to a so-and-so man, and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. Jesus recognizes his time is at hand, while Judas is looking for an opportunity for the right time for him to hand him over. And uh, he says, I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. This is the message you have to carry to the guy that you are going to meet. Verse 19, so the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. Mark and Luke get a closer look at this picture, and they inform us that actually Jesus delegated two of his disciples, you know the names of those, Peter and John, he went out, he even had a secret code how to recognize the guy that was going to offer up his upper room for them to have that special Pesach meal. It seems that Judas does not know where they are going to meet. 
it seems to me that there is a tension in the air here between Judas that is looking for the opportunity, looking for the convenient time to hand him over. He had already sold him. And Jesus Christ that knows now his time is at hand, he makes the arrangements in a way that Judas cannot exploit that moment. Judas cannot betray him, well, cannot hand him over. He had betrayed him already. He sold him already. But he cannot hand him over when he wants. He's looking for an opportunity. It seems that Jesus is holding him up because that right moment has to come. And verse 20 goes on saying, when evening had come, he sat down, he reclined, that's the Greek, with the twelve. That's the position they would take, reclining. And this was happening in the evening. Obviously, the Lord's Supper happened at supper time. I think it's important to internalize that reality. But then it goes on, verse 21, Now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. One of you will deliver me up. One of you will hand me over. This is happening as they were eating. Verse 22, And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? Could it be I, Lord? That's the meaning of it. Or, surely not I, Lord. This expression is very interesting in the Greek language. You have uh, the same expression in John chapter 4 when uh, the Samaritan woman goes and asks, could this be the Christ? Well, normally the reaction to that would be, no, he could not be, unless he indeed is the Christ, and then he could be the Christ. So this reaction of the disciples, all of the disciples, could it be me, or surely not I, Lord, gives you the possibility of, yeah, maybe, maybe not. And the text goes on, and he answered and said, he who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. And here, the Gospel of John gives us a little more insight as to what happened. John chapter 13, verse 26, Jesus answered, it is to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it, and Having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. So Jesus practically singles, at this point, Judas out. Going back to Matthew, he continues, Matthew 26, 24, The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Verse 25, Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? Could it be I? He said to him, You have said it. Can you see the, 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 the tension in the story? He's, he's like absent-minded when the other disciples ask the question, and, and now he wakes up, he was drifting. And now he regains control. And he says, hey, could it be I? You have said it, Jesus says. And the Gospel of John, again, expands on this picture it says that now after the piece of bread was given to him, Satan entered him, Judas. Then Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. 
See, up to this point, Jesus seems to be holding him back, but when the right moment comes, he says, what you do, do quickly. Tension between divine will and human wickedness. Was Judas predestined to be Judas? Well, God was fighting for him, holding him back. He was drifting, and Jesus was loving on him. But look what the gospel says here. Although Jesus singled him out, says verse 28, the previous verse here, but no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. So everything is happening there in front of their eyes, and they still don't understand. It seems that they cannot imagine that Judas is indeed the guy. Verse 29 says, 9 says, For some thought, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus had said to him, Buy those things we need for the feast, feast being the next day, or that he should give something to the poor. They, they are still under the impression that Judas is the fine, nice, good-looking guy. Yes, he does some weird things sometimes, but nobody imagines that he is actually drifting. He's drifting big time. Drifting in a way that is extremely dangerous for him. Having received the piece of bread, he then went out immediately and it was night. And this is in line with verse 24 of Matthew's account. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written on him, of Him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. I found a very interesting quote that I have on screen, David Parson, in his commentary on the Gospel of uh, Matthew, says, If you have not been born again, a day will come when you wish you had never been born at all. This is very fatalist. I rewrote it. If you have not been born again, a day may come when you wish you had never been born at all. What well, the, the difference is here is between will and may. Yes, a human being is extremely fragile. And when we are drifting, and that's one of the most dangerous things that we can learn from the enemy, this spiritual drifting, when we lose control and then we gain control and we have the impression nothing terrible can happen to us, there is a danger, and that's why I use may, a day may come when just like in Judas's case, the devil or Satan entered Judas. And when that happens, there's only one more drifting, and that drifting is fatal for him. An, un, an intentionally drifting, self-confident Christian may one day unsuspectingly engage in a final and fatal drift. And this is very sobering to me because I realize the danger I can expose myself to. To be drifting and nobody around me has a clue that I am drifting. And I can play the game of drifting again and again and again. And I have the impression I'm 
in control. Yes, I lose control, but I regain control. Lose control and regain control until somebody else takes over. But I'm not fatalist about this because we have come to Jesus Christ to sort out those driftings that we may be aware of. Let me ask you now. I asked you at the beginning if you have ever done car drifting. And some of you agreed, yeah, I have. Have you ever done spiritual drifting? Are you still doing it? Are you still drifting? I'm not here to hit you hard and tell you, hey, you are going to end up in a, a car wreck, spiritual car wreck. That's not my point. My point is the danger is lurking every single moment. And the only way not to expose myself to this kind of spiritual drifting is to have Jesus Christ in control of my life. When he's in control, he does not take my willpower away. He does not take my personality away. But he enables me, he empowers me to indeed stay on the right track. Human beings, you and I, we are extremely fragile. And drifting is dangerous. Come to Jesus Christ. Come to the one that can place you back on the right track if you have been drifting or you feel like right now you are somewhere out of control. He is able to bring you back. And if you have stayed on the right track, but have been tempted, please don't give in to the temptation of the enemy. Jesus Christ is the one that can keep you in the right direction, on the right track. And that's why you and I are here. Amen. I would like to invite the congregation for a prayer of dedication. Let's all stand. Heavenly Father, looking at our own lives, we recognize that we had moments of drifting intentional or unintentional. When we thought we were still in control, but in reality, we had lost it. Lord, you have been there trying to keep our life together on the right trajectory. And Lord, this morning, there might be somebody here that is troubled because he or she may feel that the drifting is happening, it's still happening. Lord, we pray for your mighty power to get a hold of these human beings. And if there are people here that are fighting with the temptation of giving way to drifting away from you. We pray, Lord, for wisdom and strength to resist temptation. And as we came to you now to sort out 
these troublesome experiences in Jesus Christ. We thank you for receiving us and empowering us for the next segment of our journey where we would like to continue our walk with you. In Jesus' name, through the Holy Spirit, amen. Please be seated. <laughs>